Chapter 5. The Test of Reality I awakened Saturday the 17th to another cold, dreary January morning and remembered what C.I. had told me about the controlled climate of 2150. Things were just too good to be true, I thought. How could all those incredible social and scientific changes have taken place in only 174 years? Of course, I had to admit that going back in time, 174 years, from 1976, would have taken me to 1802, a time when the world of 1976 would certainly have been considered a completely impossible dream. I thought about some of the predictions for the future made by the 20th century prophets such as Huxley and Orwell. They had viewed future man with great skepticism. Of course, they were writing about micro-man, who, according to C.I., was even now in the process of doing away with himself. I wondered how it would have affected the writings of Orwell and Huxley if they had had a larger, broader perspective with which to enable them to envision macro-man. Then I remembered that I, in fact, had no concrete proof whatsoever that the world of 2150 was anything more than a product of my own imagination. I suddenly felt a strong need to be concrete, to check out, to reaffirm my present state of existence, to touch something, to talk to someone, to hear a voice. I looked across our apartment room and saw that Carl's bed was neatly made, as usual, and my journal was lying there on his pillow. I got out of bed and, losing my balance, almost fell on the floor. I had forgotten to strap on my artificial leg. That was confirmation enough of my present state of existence. I was here, fully awake, in 1976, minus one leg. I hobbled over to Carl's bed, retrieved my journal, and saw the note saying, We'll talk at noon. Signed, Carl. According to my watch, it was almost 9 a.m., so I had slept late again. I wanted to write down all I could remember of my most recent experiences in 2150, or my dream world, whichever it was, before Carl came back at noon. I hurriedly dressed, had a quick breakfast, and was soon writing furiously in my journal. When Carl came in at 12.15, I was almost finished, so I pulled out the pages I had completed and handed them to him so he could get caught up with my latest dream experiences while I was finishing writing. Carl finished about the same time I did, and for a few seconds we just looked at each other. Then Carl broke the silence. Hey, man, he grinned. You got to be the all-time super dreamer. You aren't content with one beautiful superwoman in love with you. No, you got to have two of them. One blonde and one brunette. Even if they do wear it short. All right, I said. Any other comments? Aren't you at all impressed with the continuity? The fact that the dream picked up right where it ended before? And how about the continuing wealth of detailed information about the society of the future? Carl's face became serious, and he frowned. Yes, John, I am impressed with it. I, I honestly don't know what to think, except that if we take it seriously, we're both candidates for the loony bin. Think of that, John. Just imagine the headline. Two aspiring young psychologists, just one year from that big degree, break under load of studies and are admitted to state mental hospital. It was amusing, but uncomfortably possible. Okay, okay. I I'll be careful, Carl, I promise. I'm not sure that even keeping it secret will end our problems, John. This dream has become an obsession with you. I thought about this and had to admit that he was right. I guess you're right, Carl. I never experienced anything so satisfying, so completely and irresistibly engaging in my entire life. I'm still a bit skeptical of its reality, I added. What I plan to do is test it out like any other hypothesis. The ultimate test will be whether I can learn to liberate myself from this micro-existence, as Leah suggested, and live in the macro world of 2150 permanently. Good God, John! Carl came to the edge of his chair, his voice harsh with alarm. Do you know what you're saying? If this dream is a mental aberration, an escape from unpleasant reality, then you'll end up like a vegetable permanently off in your dream world while cooped up in some hospital and fed intravenously through the real world of 1976. Just one more catatonic schizophrenic. Carl got up and began pacing about the room. He didn't say anything. The silence grew as I seriously considered the possibility that I might be becoming psychotic. Would I eventually deteriorate into the vegetable existence of a catatonic schizophrenic? What would happen to my body here in 1976? if I managed to stay permanently in the world of 2150? Would it become a vegetable? Would it just disappear? Would it die? These were questions I couldn't answer, and I found myself wishing I could ask central information. I've got it, Carl, I said. I'll ask C.I. when I get back, 
What will happen to my body here in 1976 if I stay permanently in 2150? Oh, that's great, Carl answered in a voice dripping with sarcasm. Now let's solve the problem by asking Satan to help us stop sinning. But Carl, I... Listen to me, John, he interrupted. You gotta realize that a society, even a real one, that would let itself be run by some giant computer has gotta be sick, sick, sick. Well, now wait a minute, Carl, I replied. Let's be fair. Let's be pragmatic. Let's compare the results. Our micro-society of 1976 is dedicated to selfish exploitation of others in the interest of short-term pleasures. The selfish behavior is performed and perpetuated in the name of our freedom, our family, our city, our state, our nation, our religion, or in the name of communism, socialism, capitalism, or some damn other ism, and it has produced inconceivable amounts of human misery. The world of 1976 is a world of selfish divisions, breeding suspicion, distrust, hatred, and endless conflict both internally and internationally. It's a world so divided and so unable to cooperate that it's polluted its land, its water, its animal life, and even the air we breathe to such an extreme that our planetary survival is in question. As for our people, at least one in three lives in poverty, disease, and semi-starvation. Now this, Carl, in spite of the fact that we have the resources and the technology to provide adequate food, clothing, shelter, medical care, and education to each and every person on the entire planet. My question, Carl, is why aren't we doing it? Well, probably because we're too damn self-centered, John, was Carl's response. But the solution isn't to turn all our problems over to some bloody machine to solve. Now that's a real cop-out. They don't cop out in 2150, I answered heatedly, and suddenly realized that I had a desperate need to convince Carl, and maybe myself, of the truth the value, and the rightness of my strange experience. Okay, Carl, I said, forcing myself into calmness. Listen to me, with as open a mind as you can, because if we get lost in our emotions, we'll be really in trouble. Everything I've learned about the Society of 2150 indicates that its people care about each other and are deeply involved in helping others. Now that's not a cop-out. Moreover, I continued, they have developed a philosophy of life which provides such a large perspective that they can see the long-term destructive results of selfish behavior. In other words, from their macro perspective, they can see that we are all one interdependent whole, and therefore, the welfare of the apparently least important individual is the concern and the welfare of all. Only from this larger perspective is there any practical value in words like love one another. You are your brother's keeper, which is so you must reap or treat others as you would like to be treated. But what about the damn machine? Carl asked. Screw the machine, I shouted. It wasn't CI that developed macro philosophy or macro society, which could attract highly evolved souls. It wasn't the machine that provided love, patience, kindness, and understanding, help for every living individual. No, it was the people of the macro society who chose an unselfish macro lifestyle. And the results, I continued... The results are 300 million people free of war, pollution, poverty, selfishness, and hatred, every one of them educated and healthy with a roof over their heads and three square meals a day. Now, if this is sick, 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 I shouted as I slammed my fist down on the table, then by God, I choose to be sick. Carl stared at me in disbelief. Then he said, John, I've never seen you so, so I'm not sure what. Maybe passionately involved? You're shouting, you're arguing, you're slamming your fist around, you're swearing. This is all new to me. I don't know what to think. Well, how about realizing that I've been an uninvolved spectator in this life up till now? I prided myself on never losing my cool, but actually I was just copping out. Now, at last, I'm concerned, involved, committed, and I'm not going to back out no matter what happens. I'm going to give it all I've got to exploring and learning about this world of the future. Carl slowly shook his head, and I could see that his face was taut with strain. I'm afraid, he said. You know that I feel closer to you than to anyone else on earth, that I give my life up for you. I remember, he continued, there's some philosophy that says if you save a man's life, you are thereafter responsible for it. Well, I saved your life in Vietnam, and now I can't let you destroy it over some psychotic hallucination. But Carl, I began. No, damn it, you listen to me now, 
Carl insisted as he shook his fist at me, as though he were planning to physically wrestle me to my senses. You know as well as I that sudden massive personality changes are classic signs of mental disturbance, and you just admitted that you've got a whole new personality. Carl paused and looked at me carefully to see if I had registered this bombshell. Obviously satisfied that he'd gotten through to me, he continued. Now, John, I'm not going to argue with you over the merits of your dream world versus reality. I am in favor of goodness and mercy and justice for all, and I am opposed to selfishness, wickedness, and evil of all varieties. In spite of that, I am going to deal with the unpleasant reality in 1976 that's not escape into some dream world of the future. There was a silence now as Carl let me think over what he had just said. I thought about the points he had made concerning sudden personality changes and running away from unpleasant reality, and I had to admit to myself that they scared me a little too. However, I was convinced that for me there was no going back to the John Lake who existed prior to my dreams of 2150. I was committed to exploring my dream world of the future to its conclusion, whatever it might be. Now, how could I get Carl to accept this? All right, Carl, I said finally. I concede your points. Maybe I'm going insane. Maybe I'm running away from unpleasant reality of my Ph.D. grind. But truth can be demonstrated sooner or later. If I can learn to develop macro powers such as clairvoyance, telepathy, and so on, then I should be able to demonstrate them to you right here in 1976, right? Carl looked surprised and said, Are you saying that if you dream you've developed these powers and can't demonstrate them to my satisfaction while you're awake, that you'll give up this massive psychotic delusion? Yes, Carl, I answered. That's exactly what I'm saying. I'm willing to put my dream world to the test, and if it fails to pass the test, to hell with it. Now you're talking sense, Carl said, patting me on the shoulder with smiling relief. Since you're willing to let me be the final judge in your test of reality, I can hardly object to your continuing interest in this weird dream. I'm convinced, however, that it won't be long before your dream world fails your test of reality. By unspoken agreement, we dropped the subject and talked of other things for the rest of the afternoon. Then we went out for dinner, followed by a movie featuring the youth drug culture. On the way back to our apartment, we discussed the tremendous increase in drug usage among our generation and agreed that this was certainly a desperate attempt to escape from, or find something better than, the unpleasant reality of our very micro-society. Later, while lying in my bed, awaiting sleep to come, and hopefully transport me to the future, I wondered if my motivation to dream of a beautiful future was similar to the motivation of those who use drugs. It made me uncomfortable, and I called across the room to where Carl was lying, and once again repeated my promise to forget about my dream world if it didn't pass our test. He expressed his satisfaction with this agreement, saying that he felt we now had it licked. I was still reassuring myself when I fell asleep. <laughs>